This is sports writer Jeff Perlman, and you're listening to Gym on Base. Welcome back to another episode of the Gym on Base show. For today's very special guest, we have on someone who hails from New York. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. He's written for different publications like Sports Illustrated, Newsday, Wall Street Journal, CNN.com, uh, many other things as well. He also co-hosts his own podcast, Two Riders Slinging Yang. One of his books, Winning Time, was turned into an HBO series that I really loved, chronicled the Lakers dynasty. Please welcome the great Jeff Perlman. Jeff, thanks for coming on. Now, here's my question for you. If, if you refer to everyone as a very special guest, is anyone a very special guest? Well, not everyone in the world's on it, so I guess that makes oh, it special. Oh, I see. All right. <laughs> All right. Nice. Thank you. I'll take it. And also, great. If, I feel like if I'm the great Jeff Perlman, great is not a high-level <laughs> adjective because they're definitely greater, you know? So like, maybe others are greater, which is cool. Yeah. Well, you know, I got to give you some kind of title, right? You know? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. The <laughs> mediocre, the average, <laughs> the below average, the subpar. The halfway decent Jeff Perlman. <laughs> the poorly dressed Jeff Perlman, yeah. <laughs> Well, what are you up to right now? It's uh, 9 a.m. We're in California. So what, what's on the agenda? Well, I mean, I just uh, did what many homeowners in suburbia do, which is I put a plastic bag over my hand, reach down, <laughs> pick up my dog's poop and threw mm -hmm. it in a garbage can. And today my daughter goes to uh, UC San Diego. So today I'm uh, I'm going to squat at a coffee shop and do some research near her and then take her out for dinner. Oh, awesome. That sounds like a day. Yeah. And then the dog always craps when a car is coming by. You know, they always make you look bad. Actually, well, the worst part is they always crap on someone else's yawn, obvious lawn. And uh, there are a couple of people near here who do not like that. So I, uh, I seek out their lawns in particular. <laughs> it's a good way to do it. And I know with your own podcast, you've mentioned in the past that you record in the closet sometimes and you yeah. sound great, and, but you're not in the closet right now, right? It's not a big, Oh, I'm at my desk because my wife is taking a shower. So we have a comp, which is the closet is in our bedroom. And the shower is right there. And I did not want you to hear the background of water. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I used to do my podcast before I started doing videos. I used to do them in my car because uh, that was a oh, uh, great yeah. acoustic. So it made I've me laugh that. a little bit. I've done that too. Nothing wrong with that. I've done my podcast car, my kids' rooms, kitchen, kitchen floor, bedroom floor, closet, um, wherever, you know, wherever, where, where, whatever it takes. I've heard recording artists always mention the bathroom's good. I've tried it in there. It's too echoey for me. Too echoey. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you. Sure. <laughs> well, curious, you're from New York, and I didn't want to butcher the name. Is it Mihopak? Is that how you say it? Or Just butchered it big time. That is was it Mopak? Yeah, this is getting worse and worse. It's very, give it one more try. Um, uh, Mehopak. Okay. It actually has two pronunciations. There's a debate in the town, whether it's Mahopak, <laughs> which is what the modern, uh, residents go by or i grew up calling it mayo pack but mayo pack uh, okay mm -hmm. well, i'm gonna avoid that now the rest of the way uh, you call it the pack or <laughs> pack or whatever yeah well growing up there i was wondering uh what did your parents do for work were they did they have any influence on you wanting to become a writer or definitely well my dad well my mom was a uh, a probation officer mm. and my dad was a uh he was a headhunter uh an executive search he ran an executive search firm but in 1980, my dad used to write these guest columns for the local newspaper. Hmm. And that used to blow me away. And then in 1986, he self-published a book called uh, Conquering the Corporate Career. And it was a business book. And I remember everything about it. I was 13, going up 14 when he was working on it. And um, he self-published, so he created everything. He created the name of a publishing company called a Kimberly Press because <laughs> he wanted it to sound like a big publishing company. So Kimberly Press... And uh, I remember when the book came out in the local bookstore, the store was called Walden Books and it was in our nearby mall. He got it in this store, the Jefferson Valley Mall, Walden Books. And we would, um, it was a huge deal. And we would go to the store and take his book from the business section and put it in the front of the store in the bed, new bestseller, new release section. And you'd go back an hour later and the book would be back in the business section. You'd come and put it back. And I still do that with my books today. Uh, and I think of my dad every, my dad's still alive. But I think of my dad every time I do it and, uh, had an enormous, enormous impact on the dazzle of writing, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. Wow. So you kind of have it in the family a little bit then. Yeah. My dad was an excellent, excellent writer mm -hmm. and, uh, more, it was more, my dad taught me about self-promotion mm -hmm. and like, he truly, like he published this book and he just busted his ass to get it out there and to have people aware of it. And he would get... 
he invented a publicist. I remember he had a uh, he invented a publicist named Arthur Haviland, <laughs> and he would uh, he would write letters to different places about the book from Arthur Haviland, director of publicity, Kimberly <laughs> Press. And I just, I mean, I'm not going to lie. When my first book came out, I had an invented publicist, and I would write about. <laughs> Jeff Perlman and his new book and blah, blah. I think I made it Arthur Havlin, in fact, in my dad's honor. So um, yeah, I learned a lot from him, like a lot, a lot, a lot. That's pretty cool. And it makes you wonder too, was he into sports too? Or did you pick up the love of sports from someone else or? No, nobody in my family cares about sports. I have a cousin who does, and that's it. Um, my parents did not care at all. My brother does not care at all. Um, <laughs> to watch a sporting, to get anyone in my family to watch a sporting event was a Herculean task. My dad, if I would scratch his back, he would watch a game for a while with me. So oftentimes I'd be sitting there in front of a Met game, scratching my dad's back, Super Bowl, scratching my dad's back, <laughs> keep him in front of the TV. And I would be explaining things to him and he he would pretend to care, but he nobody cared. They didn't know anything. So I don't know. Um, I think reading really got me into it. And the local library in Mayo Pack, New York, they used to have a subscription to Sports Illustrated. And I would run down to the library and read the old SIs and dig through them and dig through them. And it got to the point the local librarian would call my house and say, we have a new sports book in uh, Bo Jackson wrote an autobiography or Ron Gidgey or whoever um, we'll hold it for you. If you come down now and get it or run the mile from my house, get the book, run back home. Wow. That's pretty good. And you are a runner, right? Or it used to be like a track. And I, yeah, I ran at the university of Delaware. I was probably one of the, I said this recently to someone, let's say there are a thousand division one runners in America probably a little more, but we'll say a thousand. I was probably 980th in <laughs> the talent and skill, but I did, I spent a year at Delaware running as a freshman and I got my varsity letter because you had to come in top three in a race. This is a true story. You had to come in top three to get a varsity letter. And we had a dual meet against Lehigh and I came in third in the 3000 out of three. <laughs> Sandy, one of those kind of races in life. <laughs> exactly. But I always, you know, I will say this. I, I always viewed it as one of my great accomplishments because I was not a division one caliber runner at all i was just a really good high school runner but i wasn't a, i wasn't a college runner but i really wanted to be so like that year i just busted my ass and busted my ass and i was not good enough to be around those runners but i you know i held my own and so i actually if you got a varsity letter you got it they gave you a blue ski cap because it was the blue head so they gave you a blue ski cap or and i treasured that thing you know it meant something to me so yeah well, are you still running these days or uh my back is really bad i got uh, okay so not so much. I was wondering if you knew who, uh, do you know who Dean Carnassus is then the ultra marathon runner? I do not. Oh, you'd probably get a kick out of it. He has a good book. I had him on the show. He's actually from the Bay area. He's ran like 300 miles without stopping. He's done a bunch of crazy stuff. And then you read the book and feel like you can do it too. <laughs> I cannot do that too. I cannot. <laughs> yeah. I did. I don't want to brag though. I went to the gym last night and did the elliptical for 45 minutes. So you oh, know. there you go. Yeah, it's very <laughs> Well, who are your favorite teams and players growing up? Because I know Walter Payton was from one of your favorite athletes, right? I grew up in tiny Mayo Pack, New York. My diehard team was the New York Jets. Okay. It's the only team I even care about now, and even a slight way is the Jets <laughs> and years of misery. And wait, I just want to say the funny thing about being a Jet fan. So I was six or seven. My brother was two years older than me. And we're sitting at the kitchen table one day, and my, my brother proclaims that he's going to be a Giants fan. And I say, okay, I'll be a Jets fan. <laughs> and my brother, I always say this and it's true. My brother, his name's David. He's a great guy. He would not recognize Eli Manning if he knocked on his door. Not on that. He probably doesn't know who Eli Manning is. Like he has no, if you said Lawrence Taylor, or Phil Sims, the names mean nothing to him. And because of him, I've had decades of rooting for the worst franchise, the worst team over and over again. It's the worst. Being a Jet fan sucks beyond sucking. <laughs> so I was a Jet fan. I was a Met. Usually if you're from New York, you either go Jets, Nets, Mets, Islanders, or you go mm. uh, Yankees, Giants, Knicks, Rangers. And I, I got the worst of that. I, I was Jets, Nets. Uh, I feel like I can relate a little bit because I grew up a Warriors fan when it wasn't cool to be a Warriors fan. And now all the people who didn't suffer, now they're all Curry fans and jumping in on the bandwagon, you know? And you're like, who's we? Where were yeah. you when... Uh, <laughs> Anta Ellis was playing for the Warriors, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, you know, I was a Brian Cardinal guy, Antoine Jameson, you know. I'm the bitter guy at the parade. Jason Richardson. Jason yeah, Jay Rich, yeah. Slam dunk champion. Not even remotely the same as being a Jet fan. Like, not even yeah. remotely the same. You've had championships. And yeah, it's annoying when bandwagon fans come along, but at least your team has given people a reason to be bandwagon fans. That is true, yeah. Well, I am curious, since you have made a living getting to – 
interview players and stuff like that. Were there any moments early on where you got to meet a player and get an autograph or something that sticks with you when you were young? Yeah, um, a bunch. So when I was a kid, my parent, my my grandparents lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Molly and Nat Perlman, big ups. And um, <laughs> they would, um, once a year, to we would go down, my brother and I, they, my parents would put us on a plane, fly us down to Fort Lauderdale for one week. We were little kids. My grandparents would um, take us to one day of Yankee spring training. The Yankees had spring training in Fort Lauderdale at the time. And we would, at spring training back then, you go to the railings. It was much less guarded than is now. And you, we would buy a program for like 50 cents and you go down to the railing and you'd yell for autographs. And uh, my favorite player as a kid was actually Ken Griffey's dad, Ken Griffey Sr. Mm -hmm. And I, Mr. Griffey, Mr. Griffey, Mr. Griffey, Mr. Griffey. Never. But this is how big of a geek I was. <laughs> there was a, a guy named Jerry Azar who was the local sports guy for Channel 7. <laughs> and I was like, Mr. Azar, Mr. Azar. And Jerry Azar autographed my Yankee program. <laughs> and I just, I think about how incredibly nerdy that is, that I was like 11 years old, excited to get the local sports guys autograph on my thing. So I did get a, I don't want to brag. I do have it. I'm willing to sell it, but for a very high price, a Jerry <laughs> Azar autograph, 1982 Yankees program, if you would like to buy that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk to you after the interview. Yeah. Talk to me after. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. And, you know, also made me wonder, cause I know, um, one of your favorite bands is Hall and Oates, right? So I'm curious. Growing up, I imagine there was probably records on in the house. So did your parents kind of influence your taste at all in music? You're too young to appreciate the music of Hall and Oates. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. You know any Hall and Oates songs? I, not off the top of my head, but I know when I hear it, I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Because I am a big music guy. All right. Everybody, this is true. Everyone over the, how old are you? Uh, 34. Okay. Everyone over the age of 10 knows at least one Hall and Oates song. <laughs> it's a guarantee. It's a lock. In fact, after this is done, I will go, I'm going to play a snippet and you'll be like, oh, I know that song. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, my parents played almost no music. My dad would, um, my parents are great. I'm not, but they were a big sports <laughs> and music people. I have vivid memories of my dad. He had a home office and he would smoke a cigar and you'd go in again, you'd scratch his back because I was this thing. Back. And uh, we're a back scratching family and you would always be playing <laughs> classical music. And uh, I grew up hating classical music and I gained an appreciation as an adult because of my dad. But when I was a kid, um, my dad had an office in Stamford, Connecticut, which is like an hour away. And my brother and I in the summer would go work for him doing stuffing envelopes or whatever his job. And he would give us sometimes like 10 bucks to go to the local mall. I, I sound so old. I actually feel like a grandpa, right now. but he'd give you 10 bucks to go to a mall. And my brother and I would go to the record store and we'd like split our money and buy like a record. So I remember like, and recently um, I found them on the basement of my parents' house and gave them to my son because my son's a big record head. So like, and they all smell like really gross and musky, but like <laughs> Michael Jackson, Thriller, mm -hmm. Huey Lewis in the news from Bay Area Sports, uh, Hall and Oates, Cindy Lauper, all these different records that my brother and I from working for my dad bought with our $10 split. Because the record back up was about $8.99. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Anyway, but we were not a musical household at all. I grew up loving hip hop uh, because of friends, but not, mm -hmm. my, not my parents. Yeah, I am a music guy because uh, I'm actually leaving later today. I'm going to Vegas to see you two at the Sphere. So, oh wow, I'm, yeah, I'm pumped for that. So I don't know yeah. if you're a U2 hater or U2 fan. There's kind of two extreme groups these days. I am a U2 uh, liker. Okay, U2 <laughs> liker, but um, I've gone to a lot of concerts lately. My again, my son is uh, 17. Mm. And he's very much into hip hop and I'm very much into hip hop. And over the past couple of years, we've seen Kendrick Lamar and we saw J Cole and we saw Tyler, the creator. And, and um, it's been a real nice bonding experience for me and my kid to have this shared certain music. So, yeah, that is great. And it makes me wonder too, uh, since you are into music, were you ever tempted or did you have the opportunity to get into like concert review or album reviews, anything like that? My, um, so my first job out of college was uh, at the Nashville, Tennessee and, mm -hmm. And uh, I was, uh, I started as a food and fashion writer. I was really bad. It made me a music writer. And they had two music writers at the Tennessee and they had a country music writer, but certainly wasn't me. And then they had somebody who handled everything else. So I actually did a lot of concert reviews back then. I did, I mean, Aerosmith and Melissa Etheridge and Hootie, Hootie and the Blowfish and me myself. And like, uh, yeah, it was a cool, the idea of getting, and I remember like back in the day, if you were a music reviewer, Number one, they would send you just a ton of CDs. 
So you're getting all this free music nonstop, like a nonstop conga line of new music, which is really cool. Yeah. Every now and then you would, uh, if an artist were coming to town, you'd get like 15 minutes on the phone because they'd be doing their PR day where they do 15 minutes in Nashville, 15 minutes in Minneapolis. Mm. And, um, you know, I remember like Brandy, the singer Brandy got really yeah. pissed at me asking some snarky ass question. I don't remember what it was. And <laughs> uh, I remember like Melissa Etheridge, do you know who Melissa Etheridge yeah, is? Yeah. At the time, there were all these rumors she was gay. And for some reason at the time, that was like big news, you know, like, whoa, Melissa Etheridge might be gay. And I remember asking her about it because I had no idea what I was doing. And I was 22 years old and it seemed like the question and her basically giving me like the, how is that any of your business uh, reply, <laughs> which was a hundred percent fair, you know, like, and I'm sure I asked it like, so Miss Etheridge, you're, you're, you might be, people say you're gay. Is that, and like, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. That's funny. No, it's funny. You said that. Cause uh, I don't know, three, four months ago, I had her drummer on uh, Kenny Aronoff, bald guy. Oh, you, you, you I know. know. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. He was great. <laughs> mm. Melissa Etheridge could bring it to him. Melissa Etheridge has a great voice. She had a really good career. This was right at the beginning of her musical career. And um, she was huge. She was actually huge. She never got as big as I thought she would, but she had a very sustained mm -hmm. career. All right. We're going down memory lane here. We could just make this a Melissa Etheridge podcast. From yeah, now. yeah. I'll appear every week and tell you the four songs I know about Melissa. She's actually in the other room. She's been wanting to kick you oh, Melissa uh, over that question for years. <laughs> well, I'm wondering... Uh, did you always see yourself as a writer growing up? And did I imagine, did you enjoy reading? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, when I was a kid, I literally have on my bookshelf right here. So there are these books that used to come out, the complete handbooks of, uh -huh. right? And there would be the complete handbook of pro basketball, the complete handbook of pro baseball, and the complete handbook of pro football. And every year they would come out. And it's basically an inside guide where every page would have different players. Mm -hmm. They'd bring out the teams. It's before the internet, obviously. So like, this stuff was like gold. And they would come out before baseball season. And I would like bug my parents. Can we go to Walden Books? See if this book has come out. Uh, it's not out yet. It would break my heart. I go a week later. Can I see? If and if it came out, I was like, huh. And I would go up to my room and I would pour through these things. Like pour through these things. And like, there's a game right now on the internet. I don't know if you've seen the Immaculate Grid. Yeah, that, that's a good one. All right. So I play the Immaculate Grid fairly regularly. I just <laughs> learned it recently. And like 98%, I'm really good at it. And 98% of the reason is because of these books and remembering photograph, photographic memory just of these books and the bios and where guys played for. Mm -hmm. I was really into those. And then I was really into, I mean, it's kind of, it is kind of cool for me that I write sports books and biographies because those are what, I mean, I absorb them. Like I absorb sports books as a kid and teenager. And I didn't know if you were reading like, Shaq's autobiography that Shaq didn't lift a pen. I had no idea as a kid. Like I just didn't know. And I remember when I was a writer for the National Tennessean, I had um I did a story about sports books. And I had Jack McCallum on. And Jack McCallum, I later worked with him at Sports Illustrated, but Jack actually wrote Shaq Attack with Shaquille O'Neal. And I remember asking him, so how much of this book did Shaquille O'Neal write? And Jack was laughing at me. And he's like, you think he picked up a pen to write a word of this book? That's not how it works. And that was like, in a way, like kind of a moment for me of like, oh, I've been living a lie for all these years. I thought I would read words of, but if those books made my youth, I mean, over and over and over. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like seeing Mickey Mouse take his head off, right? At Disneyland, you know, you get the behind the curtain. <laughs> or at Times Square, more likely. You're going to yeah. see it. Yeah. I have seen yeah. Well, I noticed on your um, on your website, you have a bio and I said there's a palm tree in your backyard. So it made me wonder, uh, does that mean you've transitioned? You're a full on California guy now or are you still in New York? Yeah, we live in Southern California. We okay. moved here. I moved here nine years ago. I'd finished the book that Winning Time is based on, which you alluded to. The book is called Showtime. And there's a guy, do you know who Jim Rome is? Yeah, yeah. He's burning. Jim Rome is burning. I, not literally. I've seen him. He's never been on fire. But um, <laughs> he um, used to have a TV show on CBS Sports Network. And it's about 10 years ago. And he would, he would have a panel of writers on. And they would fly you out to LA. I was in New York. They fly out to LA for a week. They pay you 250 bucks a day. They give you a car, a hotel, and you'd be in Southern California for a week. And I was coming out here and it was in, uh, that was in Costa Mesa. Hmm. And I was coming out and I was just like, it's just better out here. And I would say to my wife, we should move to California. She'd be like, no, <laughs> we should move to California. No. We're not moving. All our families here. I was like, come out with me one time. 
So she comes out one time. My wife is great social worker. And she takes a walk and she walks Balboa Island and she walks through Newport Beach and the palm trees and the sunny and back home, it's like six degrees. And she's like, okay. So we moved to California. <laughs> the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> well, how'd you meet your wife? Uh, her name's Catherine, right? I met her at, um. so when I was at Sports Illustrated, a colleague of mine, and still a very good friend, is this guy, John Wertheim. He's now 60, he's on 60 Minutes for people. Might, and um, he uh, he was getting married to his wife, Ellie. And I was a fringe guest. I was like the work guest. So I was like, if there were 200 people at the wedding, I truly, I was probably guest 198 and um, on the list. Ellie had no idea who I was. I actually remember meeting her for the first time at their wedding. Anyway, I went to this wedding and the maid of honor was this very cute, very small, very nervous looking uh, young woman giving a speech. And I was actually standing next to the late Grant Wall, uh, the excellent writer who died last year. And uh, he's like, she's cute. And I was like, oh, yeah. He's like, you should ask her out. <laughs> ask her out. Now we've been married for 22 years. Wow. So. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because uh, she's a writer too, right? Mm -hmm. I saw she contributes to the LA Times and has her own book, right? She's written two books. She's a parenting writer. And uh, but she's really, it's funny, no journalism background whatsoever. Hmm. She's carved out this really nice career as a freelancer, as an author. Uh, she's a parenting guru. I mean, just not, her last book is called First Phone, and it's about, um, you know, tech, technology and your kids and how to sort of handle it and navigate it. Mm -hmm. as good as I've ever seen. I mean, any parenting I've done well, it's because I learned from her how to do it. So that's true. Not exaggerated. Yeah, that's a good plug right there, too. You know, we, yeah. it keeps you on the good side. Yeah, exactly. You're not listening right here. No. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think you said you have two kids, right? So are they into sports or where are they at in life? Uh, my daughter is a junior at UC San Diego. She, um, She's no, she doesn't care about sports at all. She's very big into K pop and she hosts a radio show on the UCSD radio station called We're So Crazy. So she's a radio person. She's an aspiring history teacher. My son, Emmett, is a high school senior and um, wants to be an engineer and uh, very, 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 very into hip hop and music. And um, yeah, really good kid. I'm going to be an empty nester next year. It's going to tear me up. You guys would probably uh, mesh well with Gabe Kapler. He's a big hip hop guy and Jewish. Yeah, <laughs> and I, he recently came up in conversation because um, former Dodger Sean Green came to my mm. friend of mine, and um, we were talking about Gabe Kapler. You're not Jewish, are you? No, no, German. What? I'll Nobody's keep that off. Yeah. yeah, right, right. And uh, Kapler has a Jewish star tattoo on his leg, but it's a weird one because Jews really aren't supposed to get tattoos because of the desecration of the body and also because of the Holocaust. <laughs> so it's very strange to have a Jewish star tattoo. Nothing wrong with a Jewish star tattoo on your leg. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, he's got a bunch of tattoos, and um, I got to know him a little bit from uh, going to Giants games and covering games. So it was kind of a cool last oh. year for me. Yeah, seems like a really nice guy, actually. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, really cool guy, really interesting, and uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun talking not baseball with him, just sports and travel and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I bet. yeah. What makes you wonder? Does covering sports and writing about sports has that made it enhance the watching experience for you, or does it kind of change it from being a fan? Does it almost ruin it for you? Or? Not even almost. It definitely ruins it. Uh, I always say to people, like, people will be like, oh, man, I want to be a sports writer. And I was like, do you love sports? Oh, I love sports. Who's your favorite team? The Phillies. I love the Phillies. They're the best. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, if you want to be a sports writer and you want to do this job correctly and well, number one, you can still love baseball. So you can still be a fan of the game. But you can't root for teams. You can't root for players. You certainly can't openly root. Once you go into the clubhouse or the locker room, you have to be professional. You're not asking. You never. I haven't asked for an autograph in my career, literally 30 something years. I've never asked for an autograph. I don't ask for photos with people. Like, that's not my job. So, also, like, there was a period when I was covering baseball when I knew 99% of major league rosters. Where I knew every roster. I could tell you the players, the backup catchers, the long relievers, everything. Minor league systems. The uh, Diamondbacks and the Rangers are playing in the World Series. I might know total four guys on the rosters. If Evan Longoria is still on the Diamondbacks, I don't even know who. I, yeah, he is. Yeah. It changes everything. It changes everything. It beats you up. It, it beats you down. You've seen behind the curtain. Um, I, I haven't watched a complete major league baseball game in years, except for ones I've gone to just with my kids. Mm. Yeah. It's been interesting for me. Cause I got to get clubhouse access and 
you, know, you, you can't ask stupid questions. You can't act a certain way. You got to not look too much. Oh, you can ask stupid questions. <laughs> that, that we've all done. But, yeah, you know, <laughs> you're not a, you're not a, um, the thing is this, like when you're a little kid, you're wide eyed and these people are your heroes and it's such a thrill. And I remember a lesson you learned early on, truly early on. I did a story about Tori Hunter, who is the center fielder for the Minnesota Twins. Mm. I spent whatever, six hours with Tori Hunter. And he was great. Lovely. Couldn't have been nicer. And people would then say to you, I was a young writer. Oh, what's Tori Hunter like? Oh, man, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Blah, blah, blah. Great guy. Well, a couple of years later, maybe after he retired, he starts making like these weird homophobic comments. Mm. And all of a sudden, you're the guy who's saying that Tory Hunter is this great guy because you spent six hours with him. And the truth of the matter is, you don't really know these people, but they're not, and they're not your friends, and they're not your colleagues, and they also don't view you like they don't care about you. They shouldn't care about you. What's what difference do you make to them? But if you're covering the sport, they mean everything to you, you know. So it's a weird dynamic. It's a very strange. Like you work as a firefighter, you're you're there's a, obviously a certain brotherhood among firefighters. But there's zero brotherhood among ball players and writers. Mm. They don't care. There might be some brotherhood among writers and writers, but ball players, they don't care about you. It's a weird relationship. Yeah, I've noticed that. It, it, it's been cool, but kind of weird at the same time. I'm trying to navigate through that. And it can be a little clicky, too. I've noticed. Oh, uh, I mean, it's clicky in a lot of ways. So I remember when I first came along and I was working my first book about the 86 Mets. And I remember being in Mets spring training and all the veteran Met writers are sitting at a table and they didn't even know who I was, but they knew some guy was writing a book about the 86 Mets. And I remember hearing them talk about like, why is this guy doing a book? Who is this guy? Blah, 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 blah. And I felt like I was the like loser at the <laughs> school, the cool kids at the next table, you know? And when you walk into a clubhouse, I mean, there's no denying it. The ball players are the cool kids and the, the writers, the geeks. And we're shuffling up to them asking for five minutes of time to ask them stupid questions about a stolen base. It's a very weird, it's just weird, you know, it's yeah. cool. I love it. I love covering stuff. I love being a journalist, but it's the dynamic has always been strange. Yeah, exactly. One thing I've noticed is it's kind of like their meat and then everyone just kind of gravitates toward them sometimes. Yeah, and definitely. We're the flies. We're yeah. The flies. <laughs> yeah. And it's better now than it used to be because mm. when I was covering baseball, it was the golden age of PEDs. And looking back, people were moody. Like just moody. And also you're in the Bay Area. You never had to cover Barry Bonds. I mean, Barry Bonds, just to be blunt, is the biggest asshole I've ever dealt with in my life. <laughs> He's just a horrible, horrible human being to deal with and made everyone's life mm. absolutely miserable on purpose for sport. So it's definitely gotten better than it was when guys like that were populating the world. I feel lucky then. <laughs> yeah, he was a nightmare, truly a nightmare. But one thing I thought was pretty funny, too, was when you were in college, right, you wrote a piece on a guy who was stealing donuts from the cafeteria. So I was wondering, is that did that really happen or was that a joke? Because there's some jokes hidden in your bio, I've noticed. Um, no, what happened was, um, that's funny. But keep in mind, I was a college student. And we were very unprofessional and didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> there's a guy on staff of the student newspaper who would steal donuts from the cafeteria. <laughs> so we did a story about him stealing donuts from the cafeteria but we didn't identify him as a member of the staff or by name we just, and then we interviewed like I, it's funny you bring that up we'd ask like we found the head of dining or whoever and we'd be like we have a report that people are stealing donuts is this a problem and you know this whole like story and all it is is basically one of us swiping donuts from the at two in the morning because we're hungry yeah no. is that the weirdest story you've ever done then or, or oh what stand out I mean, I've had a career of super weird. I did a story. I spent time at the uh, at a newspaper called Newsday in New York City, outside of New York City. And my editor said, why don't you do a story where you, uh, it was holiday time. He's like, let's do a story where you just show up at office holiday parties and just <laughs> crash them. So I was like, I'm so into this story. So I put out like a thing on Facebook. I didn't say why. I said, if anyone have, I'm just curious what office holiday party is going on this year. I remember I showed I did some quick examples. I went to one and I took that one. It's obviously there's a lot of ethical questions on this story, but they had name tags and you had to take a name tag. So I stole the Mike from Datatel name tag, was walking around as Mike from Datatel. Another one, there were probably 40, 30 people at this party and they had karaoke 
and ended up singing Love Me Tender with one of the employees at the party who thought I worked for Nike. Um, I went to another party. It was Lane Bryant, I think. And I identified myself. They were like, well, I said, I'm, there was a, like a doorman. And they're like, your name isn't on the list. And I was like, well, I just started here. And he was like, well, what department do you work on? And I had this cons consultation about what answer I would give before I went to the party with friends. So I said, logistics. <laughs> he goes, he goes, hold on, goes and gets someone from the company who comes down. And I'm like, yeah, my name's Jeff. I literally started two weeks ago. I work in logistics. And she goes, all right, come on in. And the best moment of that story was my brother-in-law at the time worked at MTV and MTV had a party at the Hammerstein Ballroom, which is a big place in New York City. I saw Lenny Kravitz there. Oh, there you go. Well, you could have seen me there in 19 whatever. <laughs> I, he's like, you're never going to get in. He was like, Adam, you'll never get in. So I show up at the Hammerstein. I think of different ideas. Now, outside, there's a smoking section divided by police barricades. I slide through a barricade. I'm in the smoking section. I, I don't smoke at all. <laughs> I bum a cigarette from someone pretending I smoke. And I tell this one woman what I'm trying to do. And she starts laughing. And she goes, give me your hand. And she had a stamp to get back in on her hand. She licks her hand, rubs it on mine. So I get the stamp on my hand. She goes, walk behind me. Just hold your hand up. Don't make it a big deal. We walk past the bouncer. I hold my hand up. He goes, all right, I'm in the Hammerstein bar room. I call my wife. I'm like, you think I should find Reggie, my brother-in-law? She's like, uh, 100%. Looking around, looking around. I see him standing against the bar. I tap on his shoulder. He turns around and he goes, holy shit. And that was how I ended the story with my brother-in-law going, holy shit. So that was one of the best. That was amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Wow. I crashed one in uh, San Diego last summer. It was a, a esthetician convention. And I just happened to be in the hotel. I walked in, had free food. It was amazing. Crashing hotel parties. I mean, I've done a million. You know, there's the uh, George <laughs> Clooney movie where they in the air, up in the air, where they crash the oh, party. Yeah. And see is performing. And to me, like crashing weddings, crashing parties, crashing everything. It just... One thing I learned from Barry Bonds is um, who I hate is uh, <laughs> if you just walk like you belong, no one will stop you. Mm. That was always Bonds' thing. He would treat people like crap, walk like he belonged, but nobody <laughs> ever had the courage to say anything. If you show up at a wedding, pretend you belong at the wedding, sit at a table and start talking about Joe and Diane and how happy they look, <laughs> no one's going to question you. You should do a, uh, you can be one of those Instagram guys, you know, how to be like me, you know? I think that'd be kind of <laughs> pathetic at 51, but maybe. <laughs> 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 Well, it made me wonder, uh, you were hired in 96 by Sports Illustrated, right? So I'm just curious, how does that interview process go? Do they quiz you on sports knowledge or how does that work? No. So um, what happened was I was a writer at the Tennessee and my dream, my, my life dream was to work for Sports Illustrated. And I sent them a bunch of my articles from the Tennessee and, and oh, what I did was I wrote a really creative cover letter that actually got me in the door. I wrote this super funky cover letter. I designed it to look exactly like the front of Sports Illustrated. Long story. Uh, I sent it to them and they wrote me back and they said, um, they said, we uh, we really like your articles, but you haven't done much sports. It's kind of ironic because my whole life was heading towards sports, but at the Tennessee and I was not hired as a sports writer. Hmm. Um, could you pitch us some ideas and maybe we'll have you write one? This is a good talk of fun funky stories. I pitched a story about like a, basketball coach in Nashville. They're like, no, boring. I said, swimmers, blah, 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 boring. And then I said, when I was a college junior at Delaware, I applied early for the NBA draft. And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I applied early for the NBA draft. And, it was the whole thing. and what happened was when I was at Delaware as a junior, um, I sent a letter to the NBA saying I'm foregoing my remaining eligibility and I would like to enter the NBA draft. And I got a letter back at my apartment one day and it was from the NBA. And it was like, dear Mr. Perlman, as of this date, you are officially entered into the NBA draft. Blah, blah. And then I was home for a holiday break and I got a call from the head of security. And it's like, is this Jeff Perlman? And he was like, yeah. I was like, are you a forward at the University of Delaware? I was like, yeah. But like, I have a question. Who are you? Because we don't see any, we can't find anything. And it's pre-internet. So I was like, well, I'm a forward. And I was a forward at Delaware. I played for Edna Zedible as the intramural team at the University of Delaware. So I got in the draft. I wasn't drafted. But I pitched that story and they said, write that. And I wrote it and um, they ran it. And a few months later, I was hired at Sports Illustrated. Wow, that's pretty cool. You didn't get to attend the draft, did you? No, I did not. But I remember, it's interesting. I remember watching it. Could have crashed that. <laughs> uh, that would have been amazing. I did watch the draft on TV. And the uh, 
like the 53rd pick was actually a guy from the University of Delaware. And they go with the 53rd pick, the Indiana Pacers take forward to University of Delaware. And I was like, and they said, Spencer Dunkley. And I was like, oh, tell me. <laughs> Well, I'm wondering, uh, as a writer, you know, when, when you do write something controversial or something that a team or player doesn't like, do you ever run into them again? Is it awkward or do you care about getting in their good graces again? Like, it's got to be kind of awkward, right? So you're young. Do you know, have you ever heard of the name of a guy named John Rocker? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I wrote the John Rocker. Closer. Yeah, crazy. but crazy. Things so on I, Survivor, too. What was on Survivor. Now he's gone. I did the story, like the story that, I wrote a story for SI in 1999 that was like the John Rocker story where people learned he was crazy, where I spent the day with him in Georgia and he was just this racist, homophobic, disgusting, xenophobic <laughs> asshole, horrible. And I wrote the article about him and it came out and Rocker got suspended by baseball. He got fined by the Braves. He got demoted. He became a national joke. Uh, SNL had Will Ferrell do a John Rocker skit. You know, everything like you name it. John Rocker went through it because of that, because of that article. So. Um, the following June, June of 2000, the Braves were playing the Yankees and I went down to Atlanta. Rocker was back with the Braves because I do believe it's your obligation to present yourself like it's a professional obligation to be accountable. And uh, Rocker saw me in the tunnel. He's uh, 6'4", 220, heavily roided. I was not 6'4", 220. I'm 6'2". And um, he sees me and he goes, you don't know how long I've been waiting for this. He comes up. He starts jabbing me. Do you have any idea what I can do to you? Do you have any idea? Blah, blah, blah. So that was one of the ugly. That was definitely an ugly moment in my career. Yeah. How does that uh, de-escalate? Does someone come up and break it up? Or how does that go? How do you get oh, out of that? He storms off. That's oh, basically. Okay. I've had, you do this long enough. You get I've had people furious at me, people call, people complain to my boss, people demand I be fired, you know, like people threaten to sue, people who mm. almost sue, you know, like, yeah, it's, if you do this job, if you do this job honestly, and you're not a, uh, if you're not kissing ass, you're going to get people who get upset with you. Mm. It's a rite of passage. Well, when you do that, does word kind of spread amongst players or does it make it hard, does it make it harder to gain players trust for future pieces that you try to do? Yes and no. So at the time it did a little, the thing is John Rocker was like a racist piece of crap. Like he was, he was a disgusting human being. So for a lot of ball players, it was like, well, what, I remember being in the Mets clubhouse and Mike Piazza was a catcher at the time. And I never met Mike Piazza. And one of the clubhouse guys comes up to me and he's like, Mike wants to talk to you. And I'm like, what Mike wants he me. So, yeah, Piazza wants to talk to you. And I go up to Piazza and I have no idea what he's going to say. And he goes, uh, are you Jeff Perlman? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, you wrote the Rocker story? I'm like, yeah. He's like, what was that guy thinking? I mean, come on, what the hell? So I did get a lot of that. But I also had guys who were like, who wouldn't talk to me, who chewed me out, who said, how dare you violate this trust? It just happens. Do you, do other writers say, what are you thinking? Are they on your side or? Mostly on my side. But there are certainly people who are like, you should have given him a heads up or you should. I, I always said, like, I'm not in the business of protecting racists. I'm just yeah. not, you know, or like homophobes or whatever. Like, it's not my job to protect. He was 20 something years old. Like he was an adult. I had a notepad out. I had a tape recorder out. He knew I introduced myself as Jeff from Sports Illustrated. Like he knew exactly why I was there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not my job. I'm not your babysitter, you know. Well, you kind of said it right there. I was wondering, just from reporters I've been around now, I've noticed some people like to stick with the notepad. And I, I look at their scribbles and I'm like, I don't know how you're going to get a quote out of this. Uh, how do you do it these days? Well, I, because I mainly write books these days, um, I record and then I transcribe. I'm a transcriber these days wisely because it just takes it out of so much time. But when I was a baseball writer, if I was doing a quick turnaround story, so if I was doing like, if Sports Illustrator was like, we want for tomorrow, just do a thousand words on the Mets red series. I would probably go in the clubhouse and I'd have a notepad and I would just, zzz, zzz, zzz. you learn to write fast and you learn shorthand. I know it's like 85%, but I, as long as I feel like you get the intention and you get the words close to right, I think that's okay in that circumstance. And do you remember your first interview? Like I imagine were you a little nervous or did you already have your feet under you from doing other topics before you got to the big leagues? Well, my first one of my first interviews was um, when I was the sports editor of my high school newspaper, the Mayopac High School Chieftain. I did a story. This is actually really weird. 
There was a guy named Joe Bacchino, and he was the assistant general manager of the New York Rangers. And I used to call into a sports talk show. He had a local sports talk show, and I would call into a show, and he was awesome, right? He'd be like, every time, I would call every week, I was Jeff from Mayo Pack. And it'd be him and another host, Tim Osbury, WVIP in New York. And uh, they every time I call in, they'd be like, my man, my man, my man. It's like, and I used to, I, you know, I would, I would call every week. So they were like, okay, enough with the kid calling. But he let me do a profile on him, right? He was the assistant GM of the Rangers. I was super nervous. I met him and I interviewed him. And I did this story and it's, it's funny to read it in hindsight. And he's very lucky that I was just a reporter for a high school newspaper. Because in this article, he told me, I asked him why there aren't more blacks in hockey. And he told me because they lack the leg strength to play hockey. <laughs> now, if I, I mean, if that were a New York Daily News or a New York Times reporter, that guy's never working in hockey again. Like that's it for his career. For me, 17 years old, writing for the high school newspaper, it was like 12th paragraph. Some other thoughts that Bacchino had. The Rangers <laughs> uniforms are great. Uh, he loves cold days in Westchester. Blacks don't have the necessities to play hockey. You know, like, yeah, what? <laughs> so anyway, it doesn't was... even make sense. But they're, you know, they can play every other sport. And... Yeah, it doesn't make it makes zero sense whatsoever. So. <laughs> well, you've written so many books, and I was curious. Um, I've heard kind of maybe you referenced before someone has come to you with the idea sometimes. So do people come to you, or do you always think up the idea for what book you're going to write? Um, it depends. My first book was about the 86 Mets. That was an agent named Susan Reed who represented me for one book. And then she left the business, but she had, that was her idea. Barry Bonds was my idea. Nineties Cowboys was my idea. A lot of most, the vast majority of my idea, not all the titles are my idea. Like I put out on Twitter or social media or a friend will be like, boys will be boys was a cowboy title. That was not my title. Um, but most of them are mine. I, cause I like writing about things that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Well, it makes me wonder, uh, the Mets book, I love the title, by the way. It's uh, The Bad Guys Won, 1986 Mets, A Season of Brawling, Boozing, yeah. Bimbo Ch or, or, Do you want me to finish or no? <laughs> I think it's great. Wait, thing. here's the crazy thing about it. <laughs> I wrote that book. It's my best-selling book. I don't think I know the subtitle. Let me try it. Do you have it in okay, front yeah, of you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got it in front of me. Season of Brawling, Boozing, Bimbo Chasing, and Champions of Baseball with Me Doc or Mex? Straw. Straw, Doc. Mm -hmm. Mookie. Wookie Mex, the kid. Nails, the kid. And the rest of the 1986 Mets, the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, blah. the rowdiest team ever to put on a New York uniform, dot, 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 and maybe the best. <laughs> I was curious, though, what do you think about uh, Daryl Strawberry? He's kind of turned to a pastor now. It's kind of weird. Yeah, great. I love it. I mean, uh, yeah, I love it. I'm not religious, but I greatly admire his the way he's turned his life around. I mean, he was had a lot of drug problems, a lot of issues. And yeah, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of second acts of mm -hmm. life and turning yourself to something so i love it yeah well one thing i wanted to talk about too was i really got into recently winning time and i love it and uh just curious what was your relationship like with adam mckay because he was the director right and i know he's a big hoops guy mm -hmm. uh awesome great guy i it's funny because when um there was a screenwriter named jim heck who came to my house initially and um said um he bought the rights. And one day he's like, Adam McKay wants to meet with us. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. And then I had to Google who he was because I had no idea who Adam McKay was. I had literally no idea. <laughs> I don't know anything about Hollywood. I don't know that much about entertainment. I kind of live in a bubble. And um, we went to his house and he was like, love the book, blah, 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 blah. And from that day on, I mean, he's, he's great. He's a great guy. He's super socially conscious. He's very concerned about climate change. He's made that a calling of his life. You see the movie Don't Look Up. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> he's a hoops head. We've had a lot of texts about basketball through the years. And um, he's great. Honestly, he's great. He's that whole winning time experience. I'm sad it's over. Yeah. It's like having an awesome party and then the party ending. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, party's over. But it was one of the best experiences of my life by far. Yeah, I love that show. And, you know, it was very detailed. I know you guys use some of the same tailors that like Jerry Buss use. And I even oh, love what. Yeah. Yeah, one detail for me being a Warrior fan, I remember one of the scenes uh, you could see Rick Barry shooting a free throw underhanded. So I love that. <laughs> they, um, if you look at like just little things like the, uh, I mean, kind of like you alluded to, like let's say it's a game against the Nuggets. Not only would it be whoever, Alex English, uh, playing for the Nuggets on the court, but you look at the bench and they have mm -hmm. the numbers and names aligned from like the 1982 Nuggets. Oh, wow. 
I mean, they like spared no expense and maybe part of the show's downfall was they spared no expense, mm. really expensive show. Well, did you get to have any influence on it or is it just kind of, they make it and you see what, what the end result? No, they were amazing. They were amazing. Number one, my wife, my wife had a cameo. My kids had cameos. Mm. I, I was in two different episodes. Number two, I would get cameos wrong. It's not cameo. It's uh extra. I guess you're oh, an extra. Okay. So in season, season two, episode five, I had three speaking lines, which is, oh. yeah. We have to rewatch that then. Yeah, it's uh, I play a reporter, so it was okay. a, and um, yeah, they would send me all the scripts to read. Uh, does this work? Does that work? Does this make sense? Does that work? Season two, they let me in on the casting. Like, what do you think of this guy? What do you think of that guy? I always say this, and it's true. They could have easily. There are many examples of TV shows taking the writer, the author of the book, and being like, "All right, thanks. I guess if you want to come to set one day, you can take a picture with the star." And it was the exact opposite. They, I, it was in a, a very inclusive, immersive experience. Mm. That's it was cool. cool. Yeah. yeah, when I when I think of Magic Johnson now, I think of the actor in the show because it looks just like him. It's crazy. I see photos sometimes and I'm like, wait, is that Kareem or is that Solomon? Is that yeah. Magic? Is that Bird? Is that yeah, it's definitely weird. Well, yeah. one thing I have to ask real quick about the show, if it's true or not or made up, um, there was that part in training camp when Magic would deliver orange juice to Kareem Abdul Jabbar every morning. So that was all true? It's not true. From the book. Uh, yeah. Okay. I was just wondering. Yeah. <laughs> one of the show. uh one of the scenes that from my book that they left out that I always thought they missed out on was um, when Magic came to L.A. for the first time. He was a kid from Michigan, and he's in a limo being brought to the forum, I think. And he has a limo stop. He's like, stop the car, stop the car. And he gets out of the car, and there's an orange tree. And he plucks an orange from the tree. And he's like, they grow fruit on trees here. Mm. This is amazing. I thought that really spoke to the innocence of it all, you know, yeah. like joy of, and also the california dream of like for, i still feel that when i go outside here and there's like a mango on my tree i'm like this is insane so i always like that part yeah well uh <clears throat> you don't have to worry about jerry west coming over and trying to hunt you down do you i don't think so <laughs> I don't know. Also, he's a lot older than me so i might have a shot no that's true <laughs> well I, I had to talk about your most recent book uh the last folk hero the life and myth of bo jackson was he kind of a harder guy to get to know or i was wondering with the food background were you guys able to connect on that at all or no he's been kind of an asshole um, Oh, okay yeah he's not been great he, um, <laughs> when i was working on the book i called him early on this is during the pandemic it's 2020 uh i i didn't call him i sent an e a letter to him i got his address sent a letter with a bunch of my books and one day I was in my backyard and he called up and he was like, Mr. Perlman. And I'm like, Bo Jackson. We talked for about 40 minutes and he was very nice. He was driving to get his wife, Linda, a salad. And um, he did not, he just basically told me a lot of people want to do these books. I'm not going to participate. He's like, but it's no, I'm, I'm not mad at you. I don't, it's fine. I'm just, it's not for me. I was like, great. So I spent the next two years working on this book. Book came out. I feel good about it. And, um, I was doing a bunch of signings in the state of Alabama. This is a true story. This is one of the weirdest things I've ever happened. I'm doing signings in Alabama, four different bookstores. And one of the bookstores reaches out, I think to my publicist, and was like, we got a call today from someone identifying himself as Bo Jackson saying, we shouldn't allow you to speak at the store. And at first I was like, there's no way Bo Jackson is calling an independent bookstore in Dotham, Alabama, and telling them, like, don't let this guy, like, all these stores are indie stores. So they were like Pauline's muffins and books. It wasn't like Barnes and Noble. It was like tiny little. Well, it turns out he called all these stores and was like telling them not to let me speak because he objected to parts of the book or something. Wow. And it's like, I was a huge Bo Jackson fan as a kid. I'm still a Bo Jackson fan. And that was really depressing to me that you like, like it just was really depressing to me. And that book is a, in, a 99% love letter to Bo Jackson mm. truly is. So that was a little bit of a bummer. Well, that's a buzzkill. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, but it's a funny story. And yeah, to it's me, a great story. Uh, <laughs> when I was in college, I had a roommate named Paul Dewar. This is a true story. And we were a um, great guy. And one night we were going out and we were like, you know, your college, you're going to drink and try to hook up and all that <laughs> stuff. He goes, you know, it's all about the stories, right? It's like, what do you mean? He goes, it doesn't really matter if we hook up or not. It doesn't matter. It's just like, what story do you have to tell from the night? And I do feel like that is, it's definitely been a mantra of my career. I quote him all the time saying that. To me, like Bo Jackson calling the bookstores, wow, <laughs> super Gucci is like a great story. So I'm cool with it. And that that's that means you've made it, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, Bo Jackson's calling about me. I should be calling about him. You know, I, yeah. about me. <laughs> I do have one small confession to make. I realized as you were talking about your dad's book and putting it in the hot area of the store for people to see. Um, since I grew up a big Giants fan, I remember being at Costco when I was like 12 or 13 when the Love Me, Hate Me came out. And I remember all the contra and you didn't believe it at first, all the steroid stuff, you know, and I just remember turning the book over. Oh, <laughs> and, you're the one. <laughs> so I was like, I had to come clean because uh, I'd regret if I didn't tell you. <laughs> it's a weird, um, the whole Barry Bonds thing was weird because like, I know this isn't not to get political, but it actually reminds me a little bit of Trump in that mm. he could treat people horribly, treat people horribly, do all these awful things. But people were still like, Barry, Barry, yeah. Barry. Like the love that the Bay Area had for Barry Bonds, despite him not being very nice to fans, despite him cheating, despite him taking a big shit on history, despite him treating like Willie Mays and Willie McCovey not that nicely, the loyalty that was felt to Barry Bonds was remarkable. <laughs> okay. And you can, since it is related to Trump, you can say scary too. <laughs> and scary, yeah. Yeah. You did mention uh, before we started going that you're working on the Tupac book. So, um, you know, how's that been going? And are you up in the Bay Area, maybe interviewing people and stuff? Well, he he did spend time in, in Oakland and Marin City. So I spent a lot of time up there already uh, okay. walking. It's a place, I mean, it's really fascinating. Like, um, he moved from Baltimore to Marin City. And Marin City, as you probably know, is this little tiny enclave that's probably 90, well, at the time, it was probably 95% black. And they would get bussed in to Tam High School mm. nearby. And I remember driving to Marin City, going through past his high school. And I was like, this doesn't look right. This is where Tupac grew up. Because I knew Tupac was really poor. His mom was a drug addict, blah, 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 blah. He had tough times. And But then you realize like he was bust into this super white community. And one thing that's really interesting, that I bet you did not know. So the, where he grew up in Marin City, it's called the jungle. And all those houses, the, the housing units were designed by Frank Lloyd Wright a very famous architect and all efforts to tear down those buildings have been denied because it is a historical monument. So despite the wow. city's desires to build, like to gentrify and build these like upscale and push all the black people out and have it's white, they can't do it because the housing is protected. So mm -hmm. I just think it's very interesting. It is pretty cool. And I got a hot quote for you. I got to interview Flavor Flav the other day. And, what? And, yeah. He was your podcast? Yeah, and he was, he was at the Giants game. So I got a quick, like, seven-minute interview with him. And he had a good quote for me. Um, somehow he started talking about Tupac, and he said, Tupac saved my life. And I said, well, why? And then he said, well, I was about to kill a guy with a fire extinguisher. And Tupac said, hey, don't do that. You're going to kill the guy. And he goes, and he was right. <laughs> Wait, for real? Yeah. So I'll, I'll email you the little clip. It's hilarious. You do. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Flavor Flav. I looked it up online. I haven't seen any quotes of that anywhere. So. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was a huge Public Enemy fan as a kid. I actually interviewed Chuck D for this book, and Chuck D. Oh wow, so that's funny. Awesome. Is he wearing a big clock? I bet he was. Yeah, he, he was wearing the clock, and I I was wondering before I met him. I was like, I wonder if it actually works. And sure enough, it was ticking. So it's, I always thought it was like a prop. <laughs> it might have been a bomb. Yeah, exactly. Right <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> well, good thing the games are quicker these days. We got out in time. Exactly. That's funny. Wow, that's great. Now you have bucket list, the Flavor Flav interview. Yeah, exactly. And again, thanks for coming out. It was fun getting to know you. Yeah, nice work, man. Very oh, thanks, man. Wait, yeah. seriously, send me the Flavor Flav link. I no, I will. It. Yeah, I'll, I'll email it to you. All right. And uh, cool, man. Well, have a good one. And uh, I'll buy your uh, Tupac book when it comes out. <laughs> yeah, don't turn it over in the... Uh, in the oh, yeah, yes. All right. <laughs> All right. See you, man.